scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is that David is the spirit? calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor did they that day, did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of God for all the people. Thanks be to God. be in a moment of prayer together. Now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. And each one of us is different, Lord. And we've gone through a different type of week, each one of us. So let your word speak to us whatever that word may be for us this day. Amen. I go yearly to see my optometrist, and uh, over the years, my eyes have changed. I used to be able to wear contacts. Can't do that anymore. And uh, I don't like to drive at night all that much. Uh, seems so often when we have a night, uh, evening meeting, it rains and it's even more difficult to see. But, uh, but, but that's, uh, uh, many of us have glasses and we go to our optometrist, usually on a yearly basis. But I want to suggest to you this morning that Jesus is an optometrist. But he doesn't ask for a yearly visit. He doesn't even ask for a fee. But he said, come and see me each day. And let me check your eyes. Because it's with your eyes that, you, that there are the eyes of the heart that you see people. There are the eyes that you see people physically. But the eyes of the heart in the eyes of what you hear, in how you hear. Open my eyes that I may see. Open my ears that I may hear. Open my spirit. And, and uh, what, you, what Jesus seeks to do for us is to Christ our eyes, if you will. Now stay with me here for a moment. I'm not going to go into a long story in the in the scripture, I was thinking that maybe uh, uh, next night when, when I could almost use this scripture for a whole Lenten series. It's John 9, and it goes one through quite a while. It's about Jesus encountering a blind man and the blind man being healed. And, and Jesus does it, and, and the, not as my optometrist heals the person's uh, a sight, uh, he, he, uh, he is spotted by Jesus in the disciples as well. And the disciples realize it's somebody that was born blind. So they ask the question, well, who, who sinned Jesus, this man or his parents? There has be some reason for it. And, and Jesus, uh, ignores the question because that's not that has that's irrelevant 
And then Jesus begins the healing process. Do you, do you remember how he did this? Mm, don't shake my hand after this. <laughs> then he reaches down and he picks up the clay. And he works the clay in his hand. Does a little bit more. And then, I have to put these over my eyes. No. Then he puts his hands over the eyes of the blind man with the clay in the spittle. And the word that is used there is Jesus, and, and the, trans, the, the Greek word here is Jesus anoints the eyes. Do you know what the word Christ means? Anoint. Jesus, it's the same word that's used for Christ. So Jesus Christ, the eyes of this blind man, so that he could see. And there, there's four uh, responses when people say, well, that can't be the blind man, because he can see. Da, da, da. And, and by the time the fourth response says, Jesus, the blind man says, it's the Son of God who gave me my sight. Now, his eyes become Christ. And what Jesus invites us to do is have our eyes anointed. And that's what it means to become a Christian. Our eyes become anointed so that we see differently. We, we, uh, we experience life differently. You know, when someone is born, and uh, some of you don't have to look back so far, when, when you perhaps had, a, had your first child, some of us have to look back farther there. But one of the things about a baby, and, and, I, and I love babies, so don't go out saying, well, that preacher hates babies. But babies are selfish. The whole world is about the baby. Uh, we're, we're actually literally born with spiritual cataracts, if you will. And we need surgery. Because uh, uh, the babies are wonderful, but they come into the world screaming, pay attention to me, <clears throat> feed me, change me, cuddle me, care for me, rock me, burp me, stay up all night with me, <laughs> heal me. I mean, they just go on and on and on. And I've seen some of you, after you've taken care of your grandchildren after a couple days, and you say, it's a little break. But it's all about me. Me, 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 me. And uh, uh, some people never grow out of this. Uh, and everything's about me when they talk. But Jesus reminds us again and again that there's hope for all of us. And he reminds us that our eyes need to be Christ. So that it's not about me. That it becomes about other persons. When we read and hear this command, you are to love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor and to love yourself. It means to have our eyes Christ to the point that our, our focus is on God in all that we do. And our focus is on our neighbor in all that we do. And our focus is on ourselves in all that we do. And the only way you can do that Trinity of that is to have our eyes Christ. To, be, to love yourself. That's good. 
That's having the cataracts removed. So it's not about me. To love my neighbor is to have my cataracts removed so I don't have to prejudge them all the time. I don't have to act like somehow they're, they're screwed up. And I'm not. <coughs> you have to love them. And, and you see this... Uh, so desperately needed in families. The minister went to see a couple that had uh, wanted to join the church. And she was a sensitive minister and she wasn't there very long and she realized there was a lot of tension in that household. But she didn't know what it was. And finally, the wife said, I I've got to tell you what's going on. I, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to tell you about our family. This is killing me, and it's been killing me because for years, my husband will not speak to our son. Years ago, they had a dispute, and she pointed down the hall, and it was narrow, and she said, they go by one another, and they don't even acknowledge each other. And she said, my son reached out many times to my husband, and he just cold-shouldered him, till finally my son gave up trying. And the minister turned to the man and asked him what started the estrangement in the first place. And, and amazingly, the man could not even remember what it was that had caused that dispute. But what he said was this. I'm a proud man. I'm a man of my word, and I vowed that I would never speak to that boy again when and I'm going to keep my word. Isn't that sad? How tragic. What do you suppose Jesus would have said to that man? I think Jesus would have. Let me Christ your eyes so that you see your son for who he is. Now let me contrast that story with one that I may have shared with you, but about a missionary couple that had been uh, serving many years in a country that became communist. And it came so that there were no, uh, they were not allowed to leave the country. They had two small children. And uh, they'd been there many years, put in for application, turned down, put in for application to go back, go back to their home country, turned down. And finally it came through that you will be able to leave in two days. You will be allowed to take 200 pounds of luggage. They kind of bickered among themselves. What, what should we take? He had got quite a nice collection of books, and that's always important, right, Rick, for books for ministers? Books, right. right. And, and so, you know, <laughs> he wanted to take some. She had collected some things, artifacts from the country. They had other things that were kind of, that they traveled with. They went to the to check out to make the trip. Got their two hundred pounds luggage. Waited, or or they were getting ready to wait, and the person was giving them the permit for the travel and said, and how much do your children weigh? 
because they have to be counted. The luggage went away. They got the two kids weighed and came home. They could have cared less. Their eyes were already Christ for what was important. When Jesus Christ our eyes with our baptism, with our, our joining the church, he invites us to have that type of response for people. To see what is there that's real. The other night, I watched uh, The Beauty and the Beast. Remember how love changes everything. And the Disney, and, and you know, it's, it's fairly close to the original stories. I did a lot of research, read quite a bit about the beauty and the beast. And, um, you, you know, the story, he, he becomes a beast. G.K. Chesterton says all fairy tales almost have their roots in Christian values. He becomes a beast, you will remember, because it was all about him, right? And then the Disney movie, there's a party going on, and this old woman comes to get some help, and he treats her like dirt. He doesn't see her as a person. He treats her like dirt. And then she's transformed, and she turns out, and she puts a curse on. And he becomes an ogre, if you want to say, but he becomes very uh, grotesque. And he is confined to a castle. And the only thing that will break that is if somebody loves him and he falls in love. And then uh, uh, the way the original story goes, but regardless, the father uh, is arrested stealing a rose. And, um, uh, and he releases the father to go and says, I want to have one of your daughters, and a daughter comes. And he wants to marry her. And this one is not quite as open in the Disney movie, but uh, she comes, and, 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 and the father is free. Um, and she can hardly look at him because he's so grotesque and he, and he locks her up. And then the story unfolds. I don't want to spoil the whole movie for you. <laughs> Besides, I have to get out of here in time to get to Raymond. <laughs> and so, uh, but he uh, finally gets to a crisis point. But he lets her go free. Says, if you want to go back to help your dad, you can. It's in a bad place. And then she sees that this man that she's grown to love, this ogre, is in a bad place. She goes back and kisses him. And, uh, and then He's broken of the curse. And he's set free. I think that's what the purpose of the church is. Is to kiss people who are locked up. To kiss people who need forgiveness. Just people who need justice. We sang about peace. To, 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 to change people. A minister was in a town, had a noted speaker, <coughs> and the group that invited him to come to speak 
asked him if he couldn't stay over the weekend because it would be cheaper for them to fly him home on Monday than on Saturday or Sunday. So he agreed. They put him up in a motel in an area which was a little shady, you might say, but it was one they could afford. And uh, he went into the dining room for breakfast or for breakfast at the place and he said is there a church nearby and they thought for a while and they said yeah there's a little church down the road two or three blocks and he went down and he said pretty plain looking church and uh, people were starting to go in and, and he went in and he said uh, uh, finally uh, the choir started to come in he said, I think it probably was about 120 people were there. And uh, the choir came in. And then he said, that there came in after, after the choir, there was a man that kind of, and he was six foot four like I am, <laughs> and 250 pounds like I am, <laughs> and, and heavy. He said, could hardly walk. It was an effort, obviously, for him to even and uh, he, he said, I didn't see his face until he got up to preach. And he said, when he turned, his head was terribly deformed. And when he read, he had to read just like this to be able to see. Because one eye kind of went one way. And, and uh, he, he said, it was uncomfortable to look at it. And he read the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, on love. He said, I, I got used to his thing. He said, the sermon I would have gauged as maybe a C. I'm not asking for greeting, as I'm home, please. <laughs> and, but he said, it wasn't well done. It was, uh, but it was extremely pastoral. He said, I could see the love between that minister and the congregation. And um, I stood back and, and I thought to myself, and, and he actually writes this in the thing, he said, I, I thought of how sometimes kids with Down disease are so loving, so caring. That the hunchback of Notre Dame, or Beauty and the Beast, and those stories, and how uh, the grotesque person is often filled with love. And he said, it was like this person was filled with love. So when the service was over, I stood back and watched him greet people. He, one older woman came, and she said, I, I, would, I would wish I knew your mother. He said, well, her name is Grace. And when it was over, when the, he had a chance, this, this visiting minister talked with him. And he said, that's interesting that your mother's name is Grace. And he said, well, he said, I don't really know my real mother. I was put up for adoption and nobody wanted me. I bounced from one uh, foster home to another. When I was about 15 or 16 years of age, I, I wanted to be related to some kids. I wanted to find some friends. And I noticed this church where there were some teenagers going into it. And I went in. And I stayed. That's where I met Grace. May we share in our offering.